Hi, I'm Claudio Gerardo, sometimes known as C. Gerardo. I'm the creator of Skull, which you can find in Comixology, Kayo, that's a web tools, and also I'm a work, uh, I have a web comic untitled at wordpress.com. And you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, new day, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic artist and, and creator of many different comics, specifically Skull from Comixology. We're joined today by Claudio Girard. Uh, how are you doing today, Claudio? Not bad. Not bad about yourself. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. You know, for those that don't know anything about yourself as a as a creator in the comic field, tell us who you are and what you're all about. Yeah, well, basically, I'm actually a graduate of the Joe Cooper School of Cartoon and Graphic Art in New Jersey. Um, I, when I first came out, I was not able to break into the business, and I had to kind of get started very quickly finding employment because at that time, my parents had moved back to Italy, so I was on my own. So I started working for, as a freelance illustrator and I would do some comics on the side. But then as time went on, I just focused more on the illustration just as a way to make a living because then I got married, had kids. So I came back to comics uh, pretty much later on in my life. And, uh, but my focus always was with comics was to really experiment with the medium. I, I really love uh, the... Um, um, like the works basically of Dave McKean, Moebius, Art Spiegelman, who really took that medium. Then there's many others who really took that medium and really were playing with it. And I think it's more the visual aspect of the comics itself. So even though I do see comics as, as a form of literature, I see it as, as visual literature. Like the importance is really how to tell the story, the images, how to use the images to really tell a story effectively. But how can you also... Um, play with those images. So this is one of the reasons why uh, guy, uh, artists like uh, Dave McKean really interest me, even Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, when they were really playing with those images while tell, trying to tell a story and how it was being told. I think that's, I'm, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit here, so I apologize for that. Well, it's funny because not many people experiment with comics. It's usually just very realistic or semi-cartoony in terms of like what the newspaper strips used to be for satirical comics as well as regular comics like we all know and love like um, Calvin and Hobbes, yep. et cetera. But the experimental medium, especially when it came comes to just visual mediums themselves, whether it's fine art or whether it's comics, is something that is very rarely used these days. What What is so freeing about Exper being experimental and calm? Well, I think part of it with me anyways, it kind of works with me and my character in that fact that I kind of like working in a stream of consciousness as somebody explained it to me one time, which is where you just allow yourself to just create the comic as you're working along. It was interesting because I was watching this little thing on uh, Richard Corbin mm -hmm. and the interviewers who were looking over Richard Corbin's work said that that seems almost like Richard Corbin seemed to be very free in the way he was, he was uh, doing his comics with the images. So for me, I think it's also because it's a way to really see how can you take this medium and really push the boundaries. I think one of the things that happens sometimes, not always, I just say sometimes, we kind of take uh, comics for granted as it's a certain type of medium. In other words, it's just for the entertainment purposes. Uh, I read somewhere years ago that when Will Eisner first introduced the idea that you could do a lot more comics, like you could actually tell serious stories, he was actually being criticized for it. There was also one story where uh, somebody actually yelled at him and told him, this is what you're saying is bullshit, where Will Eisner found the inspiration to do his graphic novels was actually from a look at the underground comics because they, they were very freeing and because they're very subversive and they took that medium. So this is where I kind of like the idea of seeing what can you do with this medium and to look at it 
as an art form, not as something as one person said, it's the bastard child of, of, of the art world. It's actually something serious and you can do more with it. So while there's quite a few people who are doing a lot of work with the, the storytelling itself, such as you know, Neil Gaiman, Alan Moore, there's so many others. The one aspect I always found was interesting was, well, how do you tell that story? What language do you use? And uh, oh, there's two inspirations, I'm sorry, uh, that really kind of drive me when I do the comics. The first one is a saying from a contemporary artist who said the Chinese have a saying, one reads an image or one reads a drawing. And that kind of fascinated me because if comics, you know, be visual, what, do we really look at the drawings or do we read them? And if you read them, how do you read them? The other thing was an artist, a contemporary artist, who basically talked about how he did his paintings. And he said that he would look at his paintings and the way he would describe it was like, over here's the noun, over here's the adjective, over here's the adverb, but I need a, a, a proper verb here. And I said to myself, that's an interesting way of looking at an image. Which again, I said to myself, can this be applied to comics? And I think in many ways it does get applied because one of the things that's fascinating is in the gallery settings, there's a reason why paintings and sculptures are, are, are placed where they are. And a, a, a gallery director said to me, the idea is that when you come in, there's a communication going on between you and the artwork, but also the artworks are communicating with each other. They're talking to each other. And I said, well, well, well that's for comics too. You have images next to each other. Could you be talking to each other? And we're engaged in that conversation. So I think part of me is also maybe, part, that's part of my problem. Maybe I'm asking too many questions. But I said to myself, well, why not take a lot of this and apply it to the comics field or how to enhance that? And so that's what kind of drives me or fascinates me. I, for long answer to a short question, apologize again. <laughs> I tend to go off too long. Tangents are perfectly fine here. They're they're most they are very accepted when it comes to this stuff. And you brought up a lot of good points, especially when it comes to something that a lot of people don't see visually, as well as they either just consume the content for the content itself uh, and not subconsciously thinking of between fine art and comics the medium is still visual either way. You still have your composition. You still have your color. In some cases, you, you're strictly black and white, but that plays with light and shadow as well too. And there's still a communication in in the flow. Now, I think one of the comic creators I interviewed a while back said, when I'm drawing my comic, I do it as if it's beats to music as well, where I go, where if every scene or every, every section is a beat and do the beats sound the same or is there a pattern to it or is there a depth to it that maybe I don't see? So the same with visual medium of comics that, that you're creating as well as in, in the contemporary setting as well. It's amazing to see just where is your eye drawn and what is the story that you're seeing maybe for the first time? Yeah. Well, it's funny because um, there was a French comic I once came across and uh, many of the uh, European comics sometimes are to be biographical or autobiographical. And this one was about the artist, the cartoonist going through the Louvre. Mm -hmm. And he's, it was funny because in one of the scenes in the comic, he gets a call from his friend. And his friend says to him, and he talks to his friend, he says, yeah, I'm in the Louvre right now. It's really interesting. It's like being in one big, huge comic. <laughs> and I was like, that is a cool way of stating it. And it's interesting you talk about the beat because there was a contemporary artist by the name of Paul Klee. And Paul Klee said that when he created his paintings, he would think of music in terms of beats with the colors and the composition. So yeah, I, I, it, it, and yeah it, it's, it's, there's so much. I think the only way I can really explain it or describe it my way is there was an artist who once mentioned that art is a representation of life mm. and it has to represent all aspects of life. Well, don't comics also or can represent all aspects of life. So it can represent music in the beats, you know, and how you tell the story, tell the flow of the story. 
can it not represent also um, emotions? You know, when you read the story, uh, also there are like there are there have been comics where I just see the way the image is set up or done, where it's like it just hits me so hard. It's like um, like I remember when I first read Mouse by Art Spiegelman, yeah, and just the drawings, some of the drawing styles that he would, that he used, it almost gave you the impression. Like, I feel like I'm right there going through that. And it's like, I'm, I never experienced it. I mean, I've heard stories, but it almost feels like, is this what it was like? What they, is this how it felt when you went through it? Like, that's how it was for me anyways. So there are certain scenes and there are certain comics that you're, you gravitate towards and, and they can elicit many different emotions. And you hear this a lot with, with musicians in general, where, certain songs have certain colors or certain notes have certain colors. And if you're looking at, say, like a Van Gogh or something along that line or whatever, and, and you, you see his different periods, you see the, the colors of his, of his artwork. You see the colors oh, yeah. from a, a, a visual perspective, not necessarily a, a musical perspective, but you see the, the periods and the, and the depth of what he could have done. He's just one of thousands of painters throughout the centuries that have uh, improve their craft and uh, as a comic creator yourself I, i'm sure you you take the contemporary method of, of not only just realism but you you've merged it with your own personal style how did you develop your your own style to make it your voice your voice well first of all uh before i did the comics i was doing quite a lot of paintings at the time and i was kind of getting bored doing the same figurative work and I was trying to figure out what could I do with it and I nothing was coming to me so then I remember one time I was doing this one drawing and the pose was basically like this but I couldn't get the arm right and I kept erasing and erasing it and I got so frustrated so angry at myself that I finally just went in with a pencil and I just threw it in. I just drew it in there. And all of a sudden I noticed I had three joints and I'm going, oh, crap. and of course my first reaction is like oh, crap. So I was about to erase it. And then I started looking at it a little bit more and I said, that's kind of interesting. Could I do something with that? So I kept drawing and drawing and kept playing with it. And then I did a painting again, trying that. And I noticed what I came to realize looking at that is it's almost like to me anyway, the figure looked more human in the fact that we see our bodies as being strong, taking, can handle almost anything. But at the same time, it's very fragile. It doesn't take much, you know, you know, it doesn't, you know, if you fall in the wrong way, you break the arm. <laughs> but I also found it was a way to actually add to the expression. And I think part of it may be being Italian and actually living when I lived in Italy, when I was uh, between the ages of six and nine, you know, you saw Italians always all the time using their hands, you know, moving their hands around, moving their, you know, moving their faces around. It's like, it's, it's hilarious. So it kind of helped. It, I noticed it kind of helped with the expressions of that. So I decided at one point when I was doing a web comic, why don't I try to integrate that into the comic? But then I said to myself, Okay, now how do I lay out the story? The two things that got to me, the first one was uh, Will Eisner. Uh, when one of his books I read, Will Eisner talked about creating the meta panel. And the meta panel was a way to remove the borders, but to use the white space as a way to break up the story, to go from one flow to the next. Uh, as Scott McCloud stated in his book, Understanding Comics, the space between the borders is probably the most important part because it actually creates the timing and the, it kind of uh, clicks in the, the imagination for the next part to help include, uh, create the flow of the story. But I say to myself, with, with Will Eisner, that's fascinated with the idea of removing that border and keeping it open. So then I said to myself, okay, let me try and do that. But how do I work that in? So I figured I can use color as a way to move from the one part to the next part. But then what I did is when I was looking at border, panel borders, 
at that time, I was looking at the works of the Astro Expressionists. So there was Mark Rothko, uh, Motherwell, Clifford Still. And I said, could I actually use that abstractness as part to help with the story, but also to help try to create the feel of the story a bit? So again, I kept playing with it. And I kind of mishmashed all of that. And what I do to this day is I still look at other people's, uh, like I look at all new Indiana artwork, what paintings are being done, what artists are doing out there, even what comic book artists are doing out there, and just seeing how that all works together. But I also noticed that um, different styles really are used interesting in a different way of telling the story. So the style that Art Spiegelman used for Mouse actually was very different than the story he used for Prisoner and Hell Planet. And it was just fascinating to me. So I said to myself, what happens if you actually change the style mid-story? How does it, how is the story being told? <laughs> so again, you know, and then it, I, I had to think, and then as time went on, I had to think about more like, well, what am I telling from this part of the story to this part? Or another way of saying it, what happens from one moment to the next moment? Like when you're talking to somebody, you're talking to somebody and then you, you say, you, it's almost like somebody talks to you in one tone and then they try and get their car across and they change their tone. Or as you can see, my hands are moving around so much. So yeah. again, what if you were to change that style? How does that tell the story? And it's, it's, for me, that's what's fascinating about it. You've done a lot in your career as, as a creative person, but what is your kryptonite as a creative person? Oh, God. <laughs> My kryptonite? Uh, I overdo it. <laughs> I think there have been times when I create uh, a story and I just go too far. And mm -hmm. I don't know how to hold back sometimes. because, And it's funny because many artists, um, even people tell me that, that there's nothing wrong with being creative and really being out there but you have to know when to pull back. And they say that's the, uh, for, for writers, for, co for comics, that's where an editor is needed. The editor is needed to know when to pull you back. Actually, did you ever see the, uh, I think it's uh, uh, the uh, movie Bohemian Rhapsody about Freddie Mercury? Yeah. You saw that or not? Uh, yeah, I did. It was amazing. Yeah. Do you remember the scene where Freddie Mercury was by himself and he had to create a whole record by himself and then he got back to his get to his band and he said I was given total freedom and it's just sucked or it's like it, it just wasn't working out and it's like he recognized he needed his bandmates as a way to kind of pull him back in order to really make it work so my kryptonite I overdo it and I don't know what to stop what to pull back so then what happens sometimes is I really overdo it with the story or I would do it with the artwork or I do something that just doesn't work and it's like damn it <laughs> So that's something I have to still, I'm still working on. These types of lessons that you learn or in your life to, to realize that, you know, you know, when you've gone too far after the fact, but you know what not to do, hopefully for the future. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll give you an example. There was one story I did for this one guy, um, TJ Troy. He's a musician uh, living in California and I love working with him. He's he also has written a number of comics and short stories and I love uh, working with him. He, the first story I did for him was uh, based on um, uh, a tribute to George Romero. Mm. And uh, it was, uh, I turned, it, it was a three pager. And there were certain scenes I just went a little bit too far with. And I, and I'm, I look back at it now and going, God, I did an awful job on that. So when I caught the TJ, because he's talking about maybe doing an anthology of, of, of the works we work, uh, the stories we work together on. I said, could I please redo that story? Because I don't think I did that great of a job on it. And he said, yeah, sure, go ahead. And I said, do you have a, any preference how many pages I can do? Because I, I think I might need to do it more than three pages to really make it work. He said, whatever you need to do, just go ahead and do it. I said, okay, fine. So I went from a three-page story to a seven-page story. But it really works now. It works way better. I look at it going, and I showed it to him. He's like, yeah, it looks perfect. I'm like, yeah. It took me how many years to figure this out? <laughs> so I'm like, mm -hmm. so there you are. 
looking at then uh, Skull that's currently on Comixology, you know, what is the concept of, of that comic? And um, tell us the reaction to it so far. Sure. Okay. Well, Skull was actually based, inspired by an event that happened to me when I was uh, 10 years old. I was at school and there was this one um, classmate, I still remember his name, Francis, who was always constantly being bullied. And one time we were in class, the teacher had to step out. And again, he was being bullied. And he just lost it. He snapped. He grabbed, I think the teachers, you know, the long rule the teachers used to have. And he just started swinging on everybody and smashed against the wall. And anybody who came near him, he just was hitting. And uh, finally, a bunch of the guys were able to grab a hold of him and, and hold him down until the teacher got home, got in. And the teacher looked at him and she looked, he looked at the ruler and he's like, basically, you know, scolding him. And I was sitting there and I said, do you know how much abuse he's faced since I've been, since he's come into this class? I mean, every day he's in the school he's facing abuse. Every day he's being picked on. He's being, he's just being, it got so bad that he, he basically left the school because the abuse was so bad. And the teachers, I guess, the, the parents couldn't handle it anymore. So Skull came out, uh, and then I've seen this before. I actually went out of the Cuba school. There was a friend of mine who actually suffered the same kind of abuse. And one day he, you know, he got, you know, he got really got upset. So Skull was based on the idea of what happens when you push somebody way too far. How far do you, I mean, you know, I, I think one of the problems is when you push somebody and they don't react, you just keep going. But what happens when they get to a point where they, they snap? So Skull was based on the idea of, of maybe the reason this person reacts this way or who went this route was because of what he's had to endure, you know, and as many have to. I mean, I do believe we have to take personal responsibilities for our actions. But at the same time, if we constantly are attacking somebody, we can't expect the person to always just sit there. Sooner or later, they're going to react. So Skull, and I decided to look at, uh, look at some of the vertical titles uh, just to see the flow of the story. So Skull, uh, I wanted to, so I wanted to uh, really work on that. The reaction so far from some people who have downloaded actually said to me they really like it. They said it's very, um, uh, was one friend of mine, I wish I could quote him properly because I don't have it on me, but he said it's like uh, the, the journey of a confused mind or and, uh, and uh, 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 told through lush watercolors. So the reaction has been pretty good so far, which I'm really thankful for. I'm hoping that if I can get actually into TCAF this year, I do hope to actually have it printed and uh, oh. maybe get it out there. So that's what I'm hopeful. I'm still trying to promote it on Comixology. I went that route more because of the pandemic. You know, with the pandemic, it shut everything down. And I had the story with me and I'm saying, well, what do I, how do, so let me try Comixology and see if I can get it going and promote it as much as I can. So you know, I'm, um, uh, I, I was, it, it, that story actually started uh, working on it when I was at the Cuba school and then I shelved it for about 10 years. <laughs> so then I came back to it and I said, you know what, I want to get the story across, you know, more for that reason. Uh, what did the Cuba school provide you as a creative individual? Uh, I would say for me, what it did, first of all, is it gave me the confidence that I needed. I remember when I went to the Cuba school, I was really questioning myself a lot. I was questioning if I had the ability, if I had the talent, if I had what it took. And the Cuba school gave, really gave me that confidence to really make the comics. And the way the Cuba school works is when you go there, they treat you as a professional. You're not a student you're now a professional. So everything is based on you becoming a professional. So you're given, you have two classes a day, five days straight, and in each class you have homework assignments. And the homework assignments are treated as deadlines. So you gotta meet those deadlines. 
So I remember Jose Delbo was one of my instructors. Uh, was an, he was an amazing individual. And Jose said to us, if I tell you I want three pages next week, I want to see three pages next week. You give me one or two, two or three, I'm not going to accept it. I want to see three pages. And I will downgrade you for every week that you're late. So if you, let's say, for instance, you put the pages in, it was a B plus, it gets knocked. If it's a week late, it goes down to a B. If it's two weeks late, it gets knocked down to a C. <laughs> so it kind of forces you to really push yourself, which, again, I kind of liked. So this Cuber School gave me the, really the kind of confidence I needed. And even when I make mistakes, what was great is the teachers were always available to always uh, improve. I remember, like, I was at a time when, I went to a time when Joe was still there, Joe Kubert was there, and uh, he was a great teacher. And what was great about Joe is Joe believed everybody had an opportunity, everybody should have a chance. And even if he didn't do that well, Joe's reaction was always that, he always said this, that's one, hell, that's one hell of an effort. Like, you put one hell of an effort in, and we were like, wow. He would just constantly try and just encourage you to just keep going, you know? And I met some great people there. I had a chance to see some, I mean, I had a chance to see people like Jeff Jones, you know, actually see him talk. Like he came to our school to talk. John J. Muth, uh, Kurt Swan was there. And it, Kurt Swan was, he was amazing. Like when you talk about the consummate professional, that man was the consummate professional. Ray Harryhausen came to our school to talk you know, so yeah, I'm giving away my age here, but oh well. <laughs> so I was born in the time of the Renaissance, but anyways, but you know, that's uh, was it's just a was wonderful experience. And the, the other thing I loved being at the Cuber School for, it, it provided me with the opportunity to go into New York City. So you could go to the various museums, you could go to the comic book shops in, in New York City. So you can almost you can get a hold of almost any kind of comic you wanted. Because when I was growing up in a small town in Stony Creek, I would go to a corner grocery store. To pick up the comics. When I was at the Huber School, I could go to the, in New York City and I could pick up, you know, like I said, I could pick up books uh, by Art Spiegelman, Raw. I could pick up stuff by Von Baudet. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was amazing. So then what's the most misunderstood aspect about being a creative person? <laughs> that you're crazy. <laughs> that you're <insane. laughs> That's the one I always get. Everybody keeps saying, oh, artists are all insane. They're all crazy. And I'm going, well, we see the world a little bit differently. We interact with it differently. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're crazy. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, to me, crazy is, uh, I'm going to be really, I'm going to be really harsh here. To me, crazy is when a politician does something and they know that it's wrong or it's affecting somebody and they just go ahead and do it anyways, because it's going to get them voted. That's to me is, is insane. <laughs> That's to me is crazy, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, some, I remember one time I met this one. It was really interesting. It was a Jesuit priest one time, and he really said one of the things that really is great is, is great about artists. He says you see the world in a in a in a very new way, but also in in depth way. You you see it further, much deeper than most people would. And art is one of the best ways, especially. When it comes to anything like spiritual, art is the best way to actually get those concepts across or that philosophy across. And I, and I believe that because when I look at Neil Gaiman's Sandman, to me, what I love about Sandman, it's not, a, it's not a horror comic. It's a philosophical comic. It's a comic of philosophy. And that's what I love about that. Well, I, I can't wait to see how, how uh, I think Netflix does the series visually. Oh, It'll be interesting to see how they they do that that that's one that i'm really looking forward to so yeah what i love about the, the, the netflix series is actually the cast of characters because i i think neil gaiman chose the characters for this time period and what I, and i still remember that when the, the big thing came across i think it was i think it was the character death that the actresses yeah. would be playing death there was this big controversy and i go why What's so controversial about the fact that well, because it's a black girl playing death? It's like, how is that? In, how 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 is that any controversial? Yeah. I mean, I was even free, I was I was surprised when I saw that uh, they changed the the librarian character. Um, 
anyways, it, in the comics, it's a gentleman, but in the, in the in the Netflix series, it's a woman, right? And I remember when I saw that, going, that's different. <laughs> that's interesting. And the other one was the actress is playing Lucifer. <laughs> and I said to myself, but of course, I looked at the actress and going, yeah, the actress is perfect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Sandman is so iconic with the, not only just the writing itself, but the various artists that they had over the, over the decades. So it wasn't just one particular artist. Is, and that's where a comic, which I think is really interesting because since he, he had different artists, one of the things I was also studying about Sandman is what artists they chose for what stories. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was kind of interesting as well. Like um, when I looked at, the, and of course, I can't remember the, the series now. It's the one that Joe Thompson illustrated. Yeah. You know? The, yeah, Scary Godmother or... Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. That, the way her artwork was for that series was completely different, but it was very unique compared to the kindly ones drawn by Mark Hempel. You know? So it was just like, that's where, again, what I told you my fascination with the images, how the images used to tell the story. Because it's not, it's not about you telling the story. It's how you tell the story. It's like taking a sentence like the dog ran down the street. Okay, that's the story right there. Fine. But what if you say it different ways, like the dog ran down the street or the dog ran down the street? You know, so you're telling the same story, but each time it's different. And to me, that's where the images and the visualization can actually tell the story. Um, it's funny you mentioned Joe Thompson. She was one of my first interviews I did at uh, for a video interview at C two E two back in two thousand and ten. So um, I, I got to spend fifteen minutes talking with her <laughs> at oh, wow. the comic convention. Um, it's still one of my my favorite interviews. She's she's truly amazing. Oh, yeah. And um, and I asked her the question in um, as an artist, how did you, you know how did you know that this was the profession for you? Mm-hmm. She said something along the lines of when she was at, I believe it was SCAD, uh, she was basically told that everything that we give you is what you need to do. So you should have no holes in your artwork as a, as a creative person. So if she was told to do uh, an advertisement for soup, you know, she had to learn how to do that yeah. and she would say yes to those things. Or if, if she had to draw a samurai film or something along that line, uh, a samurai comic, you know, and she'd never done it before, she would say yes to it. And so she got this, a, a wide breadth of experience and similar to what you did with the Kubrick school, I'm sure yeah. as well too, you got a wide variety of oh, yeah. different styles and different projects to hone yourself as a professional. Yeah. There's just two words in order to really continue doing being work as, a, as an artist or illustrator, how you want to put it. The two words is, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. And that's my attitude each time. You know, I'm going to say, yeah, sure, to almost any job. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was interesting because um, uh, about uh, in December, I, for my first time ever, I actually did an animated, uh, an animation, a series of animations for a music video. Never done it before in my entire life. And uh, again, it was with TJ Troy, excuse me. And TJ uh, just said, look, I want to do a music video. And I, have you ever done animation before? And I go, yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. And I said, no, but, and he said, will you try it? I said, yeah, sure. So what I did is um, for that one is I said, would you be interested in something a little different? And he said, what do you mean? He says, have you ever seen the works of William Kentridge? William mm-hmm. Kentridge, I don't know if you know him, is a South African oh, yeah. artist, you know, with the charcoal yeah. drawings. Yeah. 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 And I said to him, would that work? And he looked at it going, yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind. So I said, okay, how do I do it now? But luckily, with uh, my wife got me an iPad a while ago, and I've been playing with it. And I said, I can do it on the iPad. I can use the charcoal. So let me try to use doing the iPad. And so that's what I spent. I spent, I did about nine, nine animation scenes using the, the iPad. And, um, he just finished the, the, the editing and I had a chance to look at the, the first one. I was like, wow. And I, I was really impressed with what he put together. But like just our experience as well was, and especially with, as you can see, with my, you know, me doing the bend limbs and everything like that, trying to animate that was <laughs> interesting at times. It's like, there was one in particular, I was like, how do I make this work here? I have no, <laughs> so 
but it was uh, it was another experience that this I think it just asked you and I think that's the other good thing interesting thing about being an artist is you need to really be open to almost anything for your not just your art to grow but you're for yourself to just remain creative and also to bring that in to whatever medium you're working in or what you specialize in because by doing that you actually are bringing something new, something different uh, to the, uh, in this case with me with comics. And that's what I like to try and do is, how, can I do this? How would I bring this to comics? How would I bring, you know, that's a, that's, that's a necessity, I think, for artists. The artists always have to be willing to experience different aspects of life. Not always easy, but it's a necessity, in, in my opinion. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay. Before I get into my more introspective questions, is there anything that I haven't touched upon that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? I think one of the things I just would like is a, pre, uh, a chance to really people to look at my work and to consider it. You know, sometimes when you do take a different path or a different look, um, you, people kind of question you. And wonder why you're doing it that way. Uh, I know of many artists who, I've, I've musicians even I've met who, who who go through that, and I go through, I've gone through it as well. So you know, with, for instance, with Skull and Comicsology, and I've also done uh, I have a website uh, where I do my web comic, post my web comics untitled. Um, uh, if people just would be willing to just give me a chance and look at the work and consider it. Uh, that's and and that that just goes for me. But any artist who goes kind of a little different. I mean, there's another artist uh, who who I'm really fascinated by. I don't know if you ever heard of her. Her name is Aiden Koch, uh, K O C H. Sounds familiar. Yeah, she is a she does these amazing comics that are so lyrical. I've never seen anything like that before. The only person that actually published her work was Koyama Press. And the book was called After Nothing Comes. And I bought it and I was like, wow. I've never seen anybody take a, a direction comics like this before. And um, she is on Instagram, so I'm following her. Uh, she doesn't have that many followers. And it's a shame that she's not well recognized because she is doing something very unique in comics as well, in my opinion. Just the, her use of images and the pacing as well is, is, is quite uh, unique. So now I'm giving her a free, uh, free promo. So hopefully she'll recognize this. And, you know, she'll she'll see this and then she'll say, "Oh, maybe I should do something nice for him." So, anyways, so that's that's the only thing I'll say. We're always looking to improve ourselves, or we're always looking for other inspiration from other different creative people, whether it's someone in our wheelhouse or someone that you happen upon in the seven billion people that are creative in this wide world yeah. that is, you know, connected through technology. So it's, it's amazing to see. What is something everyone should experience once in their lifetime? Uh, well, here's two things. One, if you've never read a comic before, especially something outside of uh, what you usually read, do it. One, you know, because uh, if I can give one quick example. When I first went to Cuba school, my whole focus was to do superhero comics. That's what I grew up reading, and that's what I wanted to do for a living. One of my classmates told me about Mouse by Art Spiegelman. And I said, oh, 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 I'll give it a shot, what the heck. You know, I didn't think anything of it. I said, whatever, you know, that was my attitude. I read Mouse, and I was so taken aback by it. I said to myself, I never thought comics could actually be like this, or even an art, or this type of art drawings could really tell a story so powerfully. So I think well, once in your life, and I think it goes with the, uh, the what I was to say, the second statement is, do something or try something you would never consider trying or doing. At least once in your life, just try something that you would never consider. And I think that would be the the best advice I would give to somebody. That's why I try and tell my kids every once in a while, but then I had to also do it. So with my kids. When was the first time you learned that language had power? Oh, that's it. I think actually I learned that when I was six years old and I had to move to Italy because uh, my parents were immigrants. Um, and when my parents decided to go back to Italy, I didn't know how to speak the language. I had no idea how to speak Italian. 
And so I was really struggling. And so as time went on, I did learn the language and I learned that how important language is at that point. That's when I knew I had language, I had power because it, the way you communicate with somebody is really important. I think that's one of the reasons sometimes I use my hands. I would say it was Italian, but I think it's because, because I couldn't speak the language very well. I had to somehow use my hands to try and explain what was going on. You know, I think that's when I realized that language has a lot of power. But to me, language is not just words. It's also actions. It's movement. Those have a, that has a lot of power as well, in my opinion. At what point are we good enough? We never are. I know it's going to sound awful when I say that, but we never are. I, I work best with examples. There's a story I read about the, the artist Edgar Degas. And Edgar Degas was uh, one of the impressionists, but he was kind of a little bit different. And he was a phenomenal draftsman. Phenomenal. He could really draw. And the story that I read basically said that when Edgar Degas was about to die, uh, whoever was at his best side table said, when it came to drawing, damn it, just when I was getting the hang of it. So, <laughs> so there were times I remember when I was told when it came to illustration comics, make sure you're, you're good enough first before you get in there. And of course I waited and I waited and I just was losing confidence because it just didn't seem like I was good enough. So I think you never are good enough. Uh, you just keep going. You just keep trying. And uh, maybe just realize maybe with the time you do reach it is by the time you're about to leave this earth. <laughs> but somebody explained it to me one time, and it kind of freaked me out. Let's say you finally got it all. Then what? <laughs> what do you do then? <laughs> you got it all. You, you, or you, you're the best around. Now what's next? What do you do now? So I think that's why I, I kind of see it that way. If you think you have it all, then you have no motivation in life. Yeah. Well, you yeah. need to find your motivation. Yeah. But it's funny. You said, if you think you know it all, how many people have you met that think they know it all? or <laughs> they, they got it all worked out. <laughs> I was in technology for 20 years. Everyone thinks they know it. <laughs> exactly. What happens as a result of it? Like I, I've met people as well. Like I know one friend of mine who in his mind, he knows everything about comics that there is to know, you know, and he's going to tell everybody what it's like. Never went over well. I still remember one time I was over at his place. He, he had a migraine. And I said, well, what happened? So he told me I want to get into this argument with this one guy about comics. And he said he argued so intensely that he basically got a, ended up getting a migraine. <laughs> This quite, was it worth it? <laughs> I mean, I'd rather get a headache eating ice cream than arguing about something that everyone has an opinion on. Exactly. That's, that's why I kind of look at it that way. <laughs> you mentioned Degas and, and finally realizing, um, you know, on his deathbed that he was just getting the hang of it. What is one thing you wish to accomplish before you die? Oh, brother, before I die? Um I try to accomplish what I can, which really is important to me almost every day. It's going to sound, maybe it sounds a little egotistical, so I apologize for that. See, I grew up as a child of immigrants, and I was told stories uh, from my grandfather and my grandmother about the war that they had to go through and losses. Uh, I was told a story about my great uncle who lost his fiance during a bombing. Uh, I was told about the story of my one, uh, one of my aunts, my great aunt, who was, was, was met somebody and never got married because the man who she wanted to marry, the family didn't approve of her. And it's almost, and they kind of, as time went on, as they got older, they felt this loss. So I think I was always kind of pushed or encouraged to say, if there's something you want to do, just go ahead and do it what I want to accomplish before I die. I just, I, I think I'm, I'm trying my best right now to accomplish what I can. You know, I mean, one of the things I also did is when I had children, at one point I was saying to myself, what if I don't, what if I'm not there that much? I'm too busy with my art. I want to do my art. I want to care. I don't want to really look at raising my kids. And then I said to myself, how would I feel if I, if that happened? You know, so I spent some time away from art just to be there for 
my son and then for my daughter uh, because I thought that was kind of important. So uh, I just want to, if I could, if I had one opportunity, one opportunity, I would love to work an assignment story. <laughs> it's going to sound nuts, but if I had the but if, if Neil Gaiman said I'm looking for an artist to do assignment story, I would. That's what I would love to do immediately, just to work on with Neil, with Neil Gaiman, uh, or even with Alan Moore. Uh, I know it might be a, it might be I mean, it's never going to happen, but at least if it just that could happen, that would be cool. Um, I have last four questions here, sure. more introspective. Well, same introspective in nature, sure, but right. they're kind of rounding out this interview here. I want to thank you so much, Claudia, for oh, coming on the thank show. Thank you. So I appreciate you actually taking time out to give me an interview, help me out this way. I really do appreciate that. You know, anything like that, I really do appreciate somebody doing it for me. That's that's what the show's all about. I mean, 13 years I've interviewed people that are just starting in the whatever industry they're starting to seasoned professionals of many decades and and everyone's creative and I love I love hearing their stories and it's kind of what's kept me going all these years as well too. So it works out. Yeah. It's a win win, I think, and everyone gets to to I don't know, maybe voice frustrations or voice their, their creativity or voice their accomplishments and you know, hopefully I can showcase their stories and to the next generation and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, I guess I really appreciate that, that you're doing stuff like this. Everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? It had to be my Nona, my, my, my mother's mother. She was, um, she was the first, I think, boy, sorry. Um, see, when I was a kid growing up, uh, especially for the fact that being a child of immigrants, I was really taught to be very practical. So comics or art was not practical. It was not a way to make a living. And um, I didn't have a lot of, my, my parents didn't love me, so I'm not gonna, but I didn't really feel a lot of encouragement from them. And I remember one time I was doing a drawing and my Nona was the one who came up to me. She said, wow, that's really, really good. And I said to myself, yeah, I came out really well. I wonder how I did that. So I remember spending a lot of hours studying it. And while I was doing that, my Nona was sitting next to me and she was knitting. And she said to me, have you figured it out yet? And I said, no, I still haven't been able to figure it out. She said, don't worry, you'll get it. And she was the one that really showed me how important it was just to be myself, but also to pursue this. Um, and it was funny because she was a woman who uh, had a lot of health problems growing up. She lost, uh, she had six, six, nine children. She lost three of them at a very young age. Uh, the youngest, the, the youngest was three days old. Uh, her one child, uh, the oldest was 10 years old. And, but she just kept on going forward, uh, being there for the other kids and, but also just continuing living her life. You Noah's know, being very care, caring and loving. So, uh, she was the, She's the one person that. From a professional perspective, you are a creative person of many years. You have done art, you have done comics, you have written and drawn and brought happiness in the world. So from a professional perspective, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally uh, successful? Depends on the time of day. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, there are some days where I feel like I'm not successful that I haven't really achieved, uh, I have not really done as well as I had hoped. Um, you know, that there's been times where I've had to struggle to try and get work, it's like especially this pandemic has been really, really tough. You know, I, I if I can, uh, I remember before the pandemic hit, I was at the, the artist project and I was in the zine section and I sold so well. And I thought I really had a great momentum going and of course then the pandemic hits. And then, well, you know what happens. So, and, you know, many people are struggling. And I know a lot of artists are struggling. And I'm finding that the ones who have developed a pretty good, strong reputation, they still continue to be doing well. While others who are not, like myself, uh, we're still struggling to get noticed or even a name or recognized. So, but there's times where you know, and this is where I'm thankful to my wife, where my wife actually said to, says to me, don't 
belittle all the works you've done over the years. Don't belittle all the assignments or the projects you worked on over the years. You've actually done really well for yourself. So that when I think about that, that's when I said to myself, okay, you know what? I've, I've been pretty successful in that area. And I've also been successful. You know, one of the areas I've been successful at is having a relationship with my kids. Cause I mean, being an artist is not always easy, especially when you have kids. So the fact that I've been able to also have a relationship with my kids as well has been, um, has proven me successful while still doing my art and comics. And it was funny because my son, one time I was asking my son, were you ever bothered by the fact that you had a father that was an artist? You know, because I wasn't like the other fathers. And he looked at me and says, no, I thought it was always cool. I thought it was great. My dad's an artist. It's great. You know, I, I can tell my friends, that, like, it's so cool that I have a dad as an artist. Or he does, or I remember my son one time telling me, like when I, I did a one humor comic uh, called Super Fight, which is a parody of the superhero comics of the 50s and 60s. He said, yeah, I told my, my friends about Super Fight. <laughs> they, they think it's really cool. <laughs> so, like, so I think, yeah, the best way to describe it is depends on the time of day. <laughs> The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Okay, this is going to be a tough one. I don't see failure as a complete, as not being successful. Failure sometimes can really teach you how, why, or how not to do something. Uh, and here's the best way to describe it. I read a story about Thomas Edison. And in the story, they say that when Thomas Edison was approached about the light bulb, before he invented the light bulb, he said uh, how he tried all these different ways of doing a light bulb. And the reporter said, well, how did it feel knowing you failed so many times? And Thomas Edison said, I didn't, I didn't fail. I just figured out a ways how not to do, how not to make a light bulb that way until I figured out how to make it light, right. So I, I think one of the best ways to really deal with failure is Feel, this is the way I do it anyways, so take it for what it is. Feel the emotions that come through with it. Uh, go through the emotions. But the idea behind it is that to stay there, but to push yourself, work your way through it. So that way what failure is really is the motivation to really do well, to succeed, to get better. Um, uh, if you see failure as the end all, then, you're, then that's it, you're done. But if you see failure as part of the journey that's going to help you be better, a part of the journey that's going to make you more of who you are, uh, the part of the journey that's going to make you, let's say in my case of comic books, help you make better comics or better artists or a better person, then that's the best way to really look at it or handle it. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic artist, a creative person, or anything along that line. In fact, you have the younger generation with you who's seeing your work and your process and maybe you're inspired them to become creative in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Be yourself. I think one of the, some, one of the problems that happens a lot of times is you try and set up a persona for yourself, the thinking that this is what people expect from you or, or the way they should be seeing you. Uh, and I think this is also where sometimes um, with certain art forms or um, they just try and find a formula that actually works that will get them uh, the money, the, the success or the, the money that they need. Uh, my advice to them is just be yourself. Be truly who you are. Be inspired what you are being inspired by. See the world the way you see the world. Ex let the people know how you experience the world. Let the people know how you see the world. Let the people know how you talk about the world, no matter how it is. And sometimes you may have to actually go against the very community that you're part of just because you want to, you're so, you want to kind of breathe. Um, and it's funny because a friend of mine told me one time that there's a word in, uh, a Hebrew word, and I wish I could remember it right now, 
that basically means breath and life at the same time. And the way you breathe life into something, into yourself even, is, uh, is to just, you know, to, have, to breathe, to just be yourself. So I think, um, yeah, I would just say, if you really want to inspire somebody, be yourself, you know, and, but know you might be in for quite a bit of a ride as a result of it. You know, it may work out, it may not work out, but just if you really want to inspire somebody, be yourself. Well, I do hate to say this, Claudia, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, no, well, I, hey, I, not a problem. I really appreciate, again, your support and what you're doing as well, you know, helping guys like me and even women as well, ladies, no offense, <laughs> but, you know, but, uh, you know, helping creators like myself who are trying to get out there, trying to get noticed and trying to just, you know, we're having our own voice. And I think this is one of the reasons why I like shows like yours. I get to see about people, I get to see other people's points of views and their own work and how they go about it. And that's important to someone like me. Definitely, for sure. And I'm glad I, my show can help their voice get out there, even if it's just, if just for a little bit. But before I let you go, though, sure. where can we find you? How can we support you? And, um, you know, where can we find you on the social medias? Okay, well, on Twitter, you can find me at at C. Gerardo. Uh, on um, Instagram, I'm at at C. Gerardo 64. Uh, uh, seems like somebody else got C. Gerardo for some weird reason, which is such a surprise. Uh, I do have a, a, a web comic uh, that's on WordPress. It's uh, called Untitled, U-N-T-I-T-L-E-D. So it's uh, untitled.wordpress.com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, Claudio Gerardo, and there's also C. Gerardo. I try and get as much, out there as much as possible. I'm also on Tumblr, uh, C. Gerardo. And, um you know, of course, my, my, my work's comicsology. Oh, and I also uh, did um, a couple of strips uh, called Kayo, C-A-I-O, which is on Webtoons. So, which is about a middle-aged guy who's trying to do comics. So, <laughs> that's awesome. So, that's, and, Love it. Uh, also, if you're any, uh, if I can get at the TCAF or any of the zines and you see me there, please stop by, even if you don't pick up something, which I hope you do pick up, uh, just come in and say hi. It'd be great to just to talk to other creative individuals and hear what they're thinking and saying these days as well. I would appreciate, I, I always, enjoy, I, sometimes I find, especially with this pandemic, it's hard to talk to others. So it's not always easy. So, but I enjoy hearing what other people are doing out there. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, our YouTube channel is unfortunately a little more updated than our website because, you know, I'm the only one doing all this stuff, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring it out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking. Have fun.